along with all the other junk. Right. Don't be too impressed by the fact that I've got a presentation. Actually, it's recycled from uh, an internal learning fair we had at college a couple of weeks ago. So um, I haven't put hours and hours into preparation of the presentation. So it's been very down to earth, uh, completely different from what I've just been hearing about. Nothing uh, on a global scale. Just really um, three ideas and experiments that we've been carrying out in the last year in our A-level teaching at Hills Road. Uh, teaching A-level computing, needless to say. So these are the three things. Um, the first one is basically just group work, some ideas on group work and how we've implemented that, and, and it's been pretty successful. Second one is a sort of very modest experiment in flip teaching, trying to get students to work, do the work before the lessons so we can free up time in the lessons for practical work. And then the third one, using blogs to support project work. So it's particularly of interest, obviously, to A-level computing teachers, but I'm sure relevant to upcoming GCSE as well. Um, so we're always being encouraged to do more group work. Senior managers and inspectors seem to like group work. Uh, I've always had a sort of vague aspiration that I ought to do more group work, but never really got around to doing anything about it. So this year I thought, the only way to do it is to make myself do it, go for a sort of big bang approach, really. Um, these are all the reasons for doing it. I'm not going to talk through them all. Um, so the Big Bang approach was very simple. At the very first lesson of the very first day of the course, students come into their um, into the computing classroom, 20 students. They don't know any each other. They're from 15 or 20 different schools, so they're complete strangers to each other. They all sit down, and I immediately make them stand up again. So this is what I did last September. Stand up, sort yourselves into alphabetical order, which led, of course, to an interesting discussion later about sorting algorithms. That was sort of incidental to this, really. Um, so they sat there in alphabetical order, sorted themselves out, and I just numbered them off around the room, groups of three, perhaps a group of or two of four if the numbers didn't work out. Said, so, right, these are your thinking triangles. I came up with a cheesy name for it, and a cheesy logo, as you can see as well, so an icon. And straight away gave them a, a problem to solve. And that sort of set the tone for the whole year, really. So whenever I wanted them to do some, um, usually problem-solving algorithm development work, got into the triangles, and they discussed it together and usually reported back, of course, to the class. And that, that was, so it's a very simple idea, but the surprising thing was that it worked. Um, I think one of the reasons it worked is because it was sort of very sort of heavily flagged. It was very explicit. So I used my cheesy icon on presentations like this and in printed materials as well. So every time that they were... So it's all pre-planned. So I was anyway going to do it. Just sort of relying on myself to think, oh, I better do a bit of group work today. That doesn't work for me. So it was all in the course from the start. And um, it worked extremely well. And I was quite surprised. I wish I'd done it years ago, really. So nothing very original, but uh, I do recommend you do try something like that. It, it really does improve their problem solving if they work together in groups as much as possible. And it's quite interesting because we started off very explicitly for algorithm development, but it's sort of spread automatically into other parts of the course. What I'd find is that if we sort of posed a question, sort of in, you know, threw a question into the air in any, in any lesson, they'd automatically get together into their triangles and, and work on it. They were just, it just became a habit for them. So it was definitely well worth doing. And, um, and they've stuck to it. I, mean, I, taught, I taught both sets this morning, actually, so now it's nine months since they were originally put into these groups. Most of them are still sitting in the same place in the classroom, every lesson, still sitting in their triangle, still working with the same people they've been working with all year. Um, which I, must admit, I didn't really expect it to last that long, but it's sort of become a natural part of the way, way we work now. And I think the fact that it was very explicit and upfront you know, helped. So I think that's the, way, the, the key to success with group work, really. Um, don't just rely on thinking about doing it um, on the spur of the moment, build it into the course. And certainly, sort of feedback from the students, you know, they, they, found it, they found it extremely helpful. They really like doing it. It's been very popular. So that's the first one. I'll probably go over two minutes. But. Second one's, I think, maybe a bit more, a bit more radical, but not, not really. And this was inspired by Quinton Cutt's talk last year about flip teaching. I think he'd been to California and, on a sabbatical and uh, seen it, that sort of style of teaching working there. So I decided that this seemed, seemed like a good idea. So just tried the same thing in a very modest way in, in my programming lessons. This is the sort of traditional approach which a lot of you are familiar with. You spend half the lesson blathering on about this is how you do a for loop. You introduce some new concepts and new technique. And then you realize, oh, God, there's only 20 minutes left. We better get them onto the computers. And they start something and they're halfway through it. And then you say, finish it for homework. Or you set them 
um, uh, a task to do for homework, and they all go away, and half of them do it fine, and the other half just fail miserably. And they come back and say, I couldn't do it, or, or even worse, they probably just copy somebody else's. So, so I did the, get rid of that method altogether. So again, made it very, structured it into the course, built it into the course, so that in the, in the booklet I use for teaching programming, they, um, there are explicit set tasks for homework. So for homework, they uh, read something, do some written work as well, some simple exercises, just to make, to make sure they've done it and to make sure it's not just... And it read, if you just say read something, they don't do it. We all know that. So there was always something for them to bring back next lesson, just to complete, not programming, purely pencil and paper work. Start of the lesson, spend no more than 10 minutes reviewing that, uh, answer any questions. Uh, I, you don't have to mark it. You just get and say, get your booklets out, and you can just sort of wander around the room and see that they've done it. And then... Within, certainly within 15, 20 minutes of the lesson starting, they're onto the computers. So there's much more lesson time spent on the programming, which is where they need the help. So they're doing the programming supported by the teacher, supported by each other in their triangles. Um, and I took it to extreme deliberately. I decided that I was not going to set them any programming for homework at all. They were never in the whole year required to program at home. Many of them did, of course, the enthusiastic, the keen, the more able ones did, do anyway. But the strugglers, the uh, weaker ones, the less motivated, were always able to do the programming in the lesson with me and their peers there to help them. So uh, you know, by the end of the year, not once have I actually said, do this, pro write, write a program for homework. All the programming was, the, so the minimum requirement at least was, uh, they were able to do in the lessons. And... Again, it really did work because so that's just, that's just an example of you know, a page in the booklet, homework task, read this, here's some, a little self-test to try it and bring on the next lesson. Um, again, they like it, they, they felt it was successful, and I certainly feel that I've, I've been able to spend much more time helping students with their programming, they help each other much more, and... Uh, 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 key thing is I've just get, got to know them much better. Very quickly, I was able to identify which students were going to struggle, which ones are going to need the help in the lessons, and give them that extra help. One yeah, well, that's the end of that one. And the final one, <laughs> one minute left. If you're doing project work, um, and it will be if you're doing A-level computing, uh, I don't know if I say everybody hates it, but I, we certainly hate it. Um, you know, we've always found it the most problematic part of the course. This, a lot of the students don't like it. They don't like doing coursework. Uh, a lot of them are very poor at technical writing, which is what the, largely what the content of the course is. We've always found that our marks are relatively low in the coursework. In the exams, our students are like, you know, the highest, virtually the highest marks in the country. Coursework, they're a little bit above the national average. That's all. You know, we've always found that to be the case. Um, and what we've done for the last couple of years is simply get them to write a blog to... Um, not in any way assess, but just get them to reflect on what they've done each lesson, because continuity between lessons is a real problem with practical work. They spent the first half of the lesson trying to remember what they were doing last time. So get them to reflect on what they've done, uh, sort of write down what they want to do next, and um, just sort of aid, sort of get them to think really about what they're doing. That's, that's, that's the key aim. And they hate doing it, because they don't like writing, but they'd rather write in their blogs than they would write on paper, I think. But I do think for some of them it's been very valuable. You know, seeing the quality of what some of them have written has been really good but it's not a sort of universal success. Quarter students just refuse to do it, pretty much, but and I don't put pressure on them because it's, it's not assessed anyway. So that's it. Three sort of quick ideas on, you know, that you might be able to use in your own teaching. Thank you. Thank you.